Uh, I, I like to think I delivered, and people, well, you heard Dale's glowing testimonial that I do deliver. There's all sorts of cool stuff, including how to, you know, out of body technique exercises and uh, being upside down, balancing the earth on the soles of your feet. That I've revealed a fourth dimension, a fourth physical dimension, which I think is at perpendicular to the existing dimensions, which, as you know, is not possible, but I've done it. <laughs> it's all in here. It's about a crazy doctor who encounters a fairy on a hillside in Scotland and says to the fairy, I'd like to learn to fly magically. And the fairy says, get out of here, there's no way. You need such a big shift of consciousness. And anyway, the doctor, was me of course, is very persuasive and finally talks this very grumpy fairy into showing him how to fly magically. An adventure. Uh, also, there's a few of these, just help yourself. We probably don't have enough for everybody, so like man and wife couples just take one. And, and you can always have one. Oh, yeah, I should say what it is. It's a, <laughs> it is a CD, clearly. Uh, but it's, um, it, it's a sort of a relaxation technique. It's as simple as that. Uh, uh, it, it explains it in detail, what you do. You just play it and follow it. And it's really a very good way of relaxing and getting down to theta. No, don't. <laughs> don't do it in the car. <laughs> OK, this is the next talk. Now, the, the, today's big event, as it were, is going to be the finding inner peace. I'm going to teach you how to do that, and I think that's one of the most amazing gifts that I could give anybody. It's fabulous. You will enjoy. But let's continue our intellectual journey for a minute. As I said, there are various targets. One of them is to, I hope, show or convince you that I've got stuff that you know, the other gurus aren't doing. You know, they're just doing quantum physics, and they're doing the law of attraction, and that's about all they've got. I think, I think we've got a bit more than that. <laughs> Uh, but this sounds very boring, doesn't it? Infinite power logic. Uh, I gave this as a, a title, An Incremental Scale of Logic. I gave this talk in 1974 in a barn in England. Uh, and a reporter, a barn, B-A-R-N, barn. B -A -R -N, barn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a reporter came along and did a very nice write-up, but he started his first paragraph and said, when I heard the title of this, I thought I was going to be bored, witless. But in fact, it turned out to be quite interesting. Uh, there are things in it that weren't there in 1974, as you'll see. But I can't think of any, any kind of fancier title, except maybe the subtitle, Slowly, Slowly, Catchy Monkey. This is an old English phrase or saying that comes from... What happened? I mean, I mean it went, but was it this that went or was it that that went? Oh, they're, oh they're, sorry, they're both still talking, good. Um, it, it comes from the old Raj, you know, in the British days. Uh, slowly, slowly, catchy monkey. <laughs> it just means take it easy, you know, don't, don't rush at it. You'll get there in the end, right, as we'll see. So, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about infinity. Uh, but I can't talk about infinity. Nobody knows what infinity is. Nobody understands it. It's completely incomprehensible. <laughs> It has no meaning psychologically. You can't possibly grasp or apprehend it, or it's inconceivable. You cannot conceive it, right? You only think you can, maybe, conceptually. It does work in mathematics. It was introduced in the 19th century, but it's really beyond mind-boggling. I mean, I would challenge any of you to actually grasp the idea of infinity. If you imagine traveling outwards from this room out into space and going on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, ever and ever. I just break out in a cold sweat. I can't even begin to think what that might mean, right? So uh, it's, it's a, a purely a conceptual thing, right? But anyway, we're going to work there in a different way and in stages. And I'm going I'm to build it up in interesting steps. First of all, let's start with single-valued logic. There's only a, uh -huh, you know, earn value, will of God kind of thing. That's all, you know, that's it. That's all there is. <laughs> it's the, it, things are the way they are because that's the way they are, right? It's a very elementary kind of logic, certainly a will of God type logic. The Greeks had it and they called it fate. And incidentally, the word fairy comes from the Greek fata, meaning fates, right? Magic and fates. Um, and if you read any Greek tragedies, you'll know that the Greek gods were, were very vicious and obnoxious and tricky. They weren't nice. Um, but uh, there was certainly a single, you know, if the gods had it in for you, they had it in for you, and that was <laughs> too bad. <laughs> uh, 
Um, Aristotle introduced a concept called prime mover unmoved, and that's a bit of those kind of infinity. If you take any cause, you know, that something happened, what caused that, all right? But what caused that? And what caused that? And what caused that? And if you keep going back and back and back, you know, even if you go right back to the Big Bang, what caused that? So sooner or later you get back to what Aristotle called the prime mover unmoved, which is the beginning of everything, whatever started the whole sequence off. See, two and a half thousand years ago, the Greeks were asking some amazing questions that we can't even really answer today, like Jack just mentioned Zeno's paradox. Do you know what that is? It's a par well, paradox means it doesn't make sense, you know, it conflicts with common sense. But Zeno's paradox was if you fire an arrow, it will never reach the target, because at some point it's halfway. At another point, it's halfway again. At another point, it's halfway again, and halfway again, and halfway again. Forever and ever and ever. So it never arrives. Is that, is that a quick so-called Zeno paradox? The Greeks were pretty brilliant. Karma is a kind of one that's believed it's all happening for a reason, it's all your own fault, we call it karma. And I think the dollar's a bit of a, a one-valued law, seems to be. That to, for, for a lot of people, being jokey for a bit, okay. But kind of, you know, not totally no. jokey. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> I mean, the dollar is a joke, just nice. <laughs> um, but, you know, for many people, that's it, the bottom line. They're not interested in any other scale of values. You know, what is the bottom line? So it's very one valued logic. Uh, monoclonal species, a la Mon Monsatan, I heard somebody call this company, <laughs> so I think it's rather good. But you know, they're trying to introduce monoclonal strains and they're trying to take over the world and have their seeds, the only seeds. This is the absolute right to disaster. Uh, variety is the whole secret to survival and life and its ingenuity and its way of getting around problems is our only chance of surviving something. Like, for example, do you know that wheat around the world is being swept by a rust that started in Uganda. It's already wiping out vast tracts of Asian wheat. If it arrives here, it's going to be bad news. The only answer is going to be rust-resistant wheat. But Monsanto doesn't want that because they can't patent it. And they, they want everybody to have their own single-valued kind of species. Listen, what happened to the Irish? You know the Irish story, the potato famine? Ireland relied on one crop, one species of plant. And when that got attacked by blight, it wiped them out. It killed a million people. This is in a country with only four million occupants. So it wiped out 25% of the population. Monoclonal is a very bad idea. And yet, that's the way the world's going. Uh, there, fortunately, there are people who are keeping seed banks now. And God bless them, because it's very important. Anyway, this, this one valued logic is actually pretty weak logic, because it leads to this kind of sequence, right? God is love. We've heard that. God creates everything, we've heard that. Bad things happen, we've heard that. So God causes bad things. Uh, duh, excuse me. That doesn't work. You know, it's not logically tenable to have good things create bad things. It doesn't make sense. So that it's kind of not, not very useful logic. Uh, I'm going to tell you about this lady. She wrote a brilliant book called Human Minds, and it's not a book you're ever likely to want to read, so I'll summarize it for you, what she said. In development from childhood, we go through four major modes. There's point mode, which is clearly one valued logic step, right? Like now, the child, the infant, has no concept of past and future. They barely can figure out what shapes are, uh, you know, which is milk and which isn't. Uh, but then pretty quickly, about eight months or so, the child uh, has developed line mode, meaning there is a concept of forwards and backwards. So they've got some idea of time, some idea of future, and some idea of past. Uh, we then go into the construct mode, the elder child, where there's creativity and thinking and conceptualizing, but related mainly to experience. Not the same as imagination, right? Imagination is the next one. Intellectual transcendent mode, where you jump completely off the line into any kind of fantasy, imagination. The, the, I, I struggled with the definition of imagination the other day, but I came up with what I think is a good one, which is creating something that doesn't depend on anything that's already there. You know, it's a completely new idea. Uh, it, can re it, it can be similar to, or you can relate it to other things if you choose, but it didn't have its start in something real. That's my kind of definition of uh, imagination. And mathematics, of course, is a bit like that. Math, you, you know, you, it's a conceptual thing. Uh, even if you have, you know, like two, two apples or ten apples, those are numbers and counting. But to manipulate those numbers conceptually uh, is purely intellectual transcendent mode, as she said. Anyway, let's move on from one-valued logic to two-valued logic. 
the thing is either right or wrong, it's good or bad, it's top or bottom, it's beautiful or it's ugly, okay? Those, those kind of things. Aristotle called these dichotomies. Uh, and anyone like to throw a couple of these in the pot? Some more? Anyone? Strong and weak. Strong and weak? Good, yeah. That's, uh, that's good for nuclear forces. What? Light and dark. Light and dark, yeah. And positive and negative, yin and yang, all, all of those kind of things. What Aristotle basically said, his definition was there are two substances, if you like. There's A and then there's not A. So if it's, you know, it's, it's not A. It, and that's called Aristotelian logic. That term was invented by a guy called Alfred Korzybski, who also in Euzanian logic, which is what I'm actually going to be. T but it's just basically A or not A kind of logic. Um, oh, one, this is the important point about dichotomies, really. When you get into this, one, one creates the other. You know, by inventing one, you automatically create the, the opposite thing. Do you see? It's, it's kind of a tricky thing. You know, if you, get, if you invent the idea of rich, then you've got people who are not, so they're poor. You know, they're not A, so they're poor. But really, poor, rich, if you didn't have rich, same, you know, things. what, sorry? Yeah, name wasn't too bad logic. That was a mistake. Uh, explain. Just the names to two ends of the same stick? Uh, we're coming to that, okay? I will do what, what you want me to say right at the end. <laughs> uh, but we recognize, well, never no, no mind, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> You're quite correct, okay? Um, this, in this two valued logic, there's the idea of choice, and this is uh, the, the sort of Bible metaphor of the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Knowledge. It's not really, I think, uh, I think most people miss the metaphor. It's not really about good and bad behavior. It's really more about choice. You know, once you, once you realize there is a choice, you know, you didn't have to do what God said, then it all starts to get fuzzy and complicated from there. And that was the real point of that story, I think. Um, it was quite a burden then, because there's, there's the stress and strain then of the opposites. You know, it's good or it's bad, it's, or evil, or uh, it's something you want or something you don't want, and so on. We take this dichotomy view as a given truth, you know, like, it, well, obviously, you know, things are good or bad, they can't, you know, it's got to be one or the other, <laughs> but it's not actually that true, really. Uh, there's a better version of that, which uh, engineers get us onto, for example, yes, no, and maybe, you know, the bridge is probably long enough, but it might not be in hot weather, you know, it might expand or contract and there might be problems, so you put roll the bearings on, because of the, the maybe, and there's this uncertainty element, okay, that's the, that's the key part of this three-valued logic. And it's all, about, quantum physics is all about uncertainty. I don't know if you know that, but that's, that's one of its fundamental principles, is you can't be sure. They have this, I don't want to get technical, but they call it the state, state vector, isn't it? And, uh, and it's, it's one of those hanging things. You don't know if it's one or the other. The minute, you, the minute you investigate it and see which it is, you've actually collapsed the vector. So it's not, it's not valid anymore. It's gone one pathway or the other. And quantum physics doesn't really do that. It hangs in the kind of maybe states. And the famous uh, experiment that illustrates this is Schrodinger's cat. Anyone heard of the Schrodinger, apart from Jack, obviously, the Schrodinger cat experiment? Two or three of you, yeah. What it, it's basically a set, it's a mind experiment. It means you don't have to do it, right? So this is not being unkind to cats. <laughs> but you lock a cat in a box, seal it so you don't know what's happening. But inside the box is a cat, some prussic acid, cyanide, and a lever that will break the file. So the cat may trigger the lever, in which case it will die, or it may not. You don't know which, right? Uh, the minute you open the box to see, that, that's the state vector. The minute you open the box to see, you've messed it up because it's gone one way or the other and it's no longer true, it's just that state. And it all sounds weird. I mean, it does sound completely weird, doesn't it? Because quantum physics is famously weird. But the point is it works and that's what we can't get around. Quantum physics, you know, is the reason you're watching this image, you know, your iPods, computers, all these things are based on this weird quantum uncertainty. Uh, this sort of indeterminate state or in-between state, this neither one or another state. I don't want to get any more involved. This is not a, a talk on physics. Uh, Eastern mysticism has some... Oh, something funny has happened to my letters. Anyway, Eastern mysticism has this kind of summation of opposites. Uh, I'm sorry, the font's gone wrong. In fact, it shouldn't be even be black. And in fact, I've lost my background, haven't I? Is it, is that, it's, bl it's gone blue, hasn't it? Do it? Or is it white? And do you at the back see it white? I'm seeing it blue. White here. Oh, okay. Okay, that's fine. 
but uh, Eastern mysticism is full, of, like Buddhism, you know, Buddha talked of the middle way or the sort of higher third, you know, it's neither that nor that, it's this higher thing that kind of summates them both and really brings them both together. Here's another example. <clears throat> the same kind of thinking. And it's, you know, it's often said that oriental minds, oriental thinking is a bit alien to us. We're not quite the same. Certainly there's a strong degree of this in the way that they do things. Uh, in the Tao. Now, anyone remember that famous book in the 70s, The Tao of Physics by Fritjof Capra? <coughs> He, he was the first person to write about it, although it was a developing idea at Esalen at that time. But that Eastern mysticism contained a lot of essential scientific truths. Once you, you know, once you dive into quantum physics, it doesn't, it's not very logical anyway. You know, it starts you getting into the weird. <laughs> anyway, let's go on to fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic wasn't there when I first gave this talk. It, it's, uh, it wasn't invented by Bart Kosko, but Bart Kosko famously pos uh, popularized it. And again, it's one of those, it, it's neither this nor that, it's something in between, or could be, or maybe, very grey sort of thing. But unless you doubt that it works and think, well, that doesn't, that's baloney. The, t the Tokyo rail system uh, operates on sort of microscopic accuracy, fully and reliably based on this fuzzy logic, uh, so-called fuzzy logic. Of course, it's got its detractors. I, there's a guy, I can't remember, isn't Jack Man, even know who I mean, but he stamped and thumped, you know, uh, fuzzy logic is wrong, wrong, damnably wrong. <laughs> but it works, so how can it be damnably wrong? Do you know who I mean? He was some, out of the Stanford or uh, UCLA, I think, one of the two. Um, we, but we now, this is kind of creeping in now. We have something called soft computing. Computers are famously based on yes or no, a positive or a negative, binary logic. It's either a one or a zero. It's, you know, it, there's no, no gray areas. But there are now, and computers are now being, being developed that can do this kind of gray, fuzzy thinking. What, what use is it? Well, it's useful for artificial intelligence, if that's useful. I'm not sure it is. <laughs> but it's more useful here in things like expert diagnostics. For example, a medical diagnostic system. There's no such possibility in medical diagnosing of saying this absolutely is uh, lobe pneumonia, left side, left upper lobe. It just isn't like that. It's like it probably is, but it could be this. You should check that out and check that out. That's how a diagnostician thinks. Uh, there are no hard and fast divisions. So we need this kind of fuzzy, grayish kind of thinking if it's going to work at all. Right? And uh, I don't know if you've heard of neural networks. That's one of the latest buzzes. Not just neural networks in our brain. These are learning systems, but they're now creating computers that model all that, electronic systems that are also called neural networks. So this kind of fuzzy, fuzzy logic is valuable to us. You know, it works in real life. It works in science. OK, let's go on and do now. And this one wasn't in my original talk. This is um, Bruce, what's happened to the, what's happened to the audience camera? Yeah, okay. Um, I've introduced this. Uh, it's based on something from a system called General Systematics by John Bennett. Um, he didn't quite put it this way, but adapting what he's got, I think I've got a much better model than his, which I'm calling fourfold logic. And the, the generic is simply this you just have two lines like a Cartesian uh, matrix. And one of the lines is, let's take this as a trait B, so going that way, it's more and more of trait B, or less and less of trait B, more and more of trait A, or less and less of trait A. So it's a kind of matrix on which you can plot things. And if that's a bit vague, and it's Stephen Covey's use of this, right? And I think this is a famous model you probably all know. It's a good way of dividing up work. He says, what's urgent, what isn't urgent, what's important, and what's not important. And it gives rise to the, he was calling them quadrants, right? So you've got, in this quadrant, you've got things that are urgent and they're important. In this quadrant, things that are certainly important, but they're not urgent. Here we've got things that are neither nor important. And this category would be definitely urgent, but not really not important. And of course, part of his teaching is you don't, you don't need to worry about any of this. It's not important. Forget it, right? Uh, you shouldn't be working here because urgency is distracting. You should really try and get everything into this quadrant. So you only work on things that really matter, but you don't get yourself into emergencies and crises. Uh, but so many people work here. I mean, the email is classic for this quadrant, right? Every time an email comes in, it's terribly unimportant. But what else can you do with it? You know, if you just click off it, you're still going to come back and reply to it. And it's, it's one of the biggest hassles in life and business is what the hell do you do with emails, honestly? 
<laughs> but you know, you, you can't, all of them. I mean, I, del I delete, I get about two or 300 emails a day and I, I can easily delete 250 of them. That's, but you know, that 50 is still a lot of emails. It's terrible, isn't it? So what we're going to do, folks, I think, uh, yeah, we don't, yes, we're going to take a look at it this way. You're just going to take one sheet of paper, do a box like that, okay? And what we want is one axis that says, what do you want, what do you not want, and what are you doing, and what are you not doing, okay? Yes. We, we want to know, well, the, the line, one line, let's take the vertical line. Upwards is what you want, and downwards is what you don't want. That's the, that's the vertical line, okay? <clears throat> And then the horizontal line, for those of you who are ready, uh, to the right is uh, doing, and to the left, you're not doing it. So you can see you'll end up with four quadrants, right? <coughs> there are things that you are not doing, but you want to do. There are things that you are doing, and you want to do them. There are things you're not doing, but you don't want to do them anyway. And there are things you're not doing, but you do want to do them, right? So it'll give you four choices. What I'd like you to do then is work, just put something in each quadrant. Usually two or three answers might jump at you. But usually what I find with this is that there's usually one important thing. You know, you're not looking for a list of ten things that you'd want to do. Really, one thing will pop out. That's what I really want to do and I'm not doing it, you know? Okay? So just see what that reveals to you, plotting your desires and activities. So just to understand, the right quadrant would be, what do I want to do that I... No. What did I say? I said... Uh, uh, Wanting is above. Up is one, so you don't want it is down. Doing is to the right, not doing is to the left. I should have done a graphic, so that's taught me right, something. Thank you. And then, f f so, it doesn't matter which order you do them in. The, the least important, obviously, is things that you're not doing, but you don't want to do them anyway. But it's interesting how it actually uh, releases emotions, even just looking at that just being aware of the things that are in that quadrant. Anyone gets completely stuck or an empty quadrant, let me know, but I don't think you will. The easiest to start on is something you'd like to do, but you're not doing it. Uh, our attention is often focused on that. You know, it's a constant running subconscious <laughs> chatter. I want to do this. Still not doing it. Like I said, there's maybe more than one answer, but there's usually one important answer will stand out for you. Yes, you're right. Yeah, you're Dang. <laughs> uh, yep, Nicholas is quite right. We can delete these. Yes. What are you doing that you want to do, and what are you doing that you, what are you not? Well, it, well it, actually, it should be this way. So, what are you, what are you doing that you want to do, and what are you not doing that you want to do? And then what are you doing that you don't want to do and what are you not doing that you don't want to do? I am sorry if I've confused you, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll amend that. In, in any case, I don't think that's working, is it? I'm gonna, I'll replace it with a, a matrix graphic for the next time I give this, so thank you for the feedback on that. And if anyone gets a particularly interesting insight, let us know. Something you've perhaps not thought of before. And also in the next, the next session, I'm going to be doing a process that will help release issues. And you might find an issue this way. You know, you're not doing something you want to do. Well, well why not? You know, what's the issue? There might be something behind that. So we could carry that over into the next segment. Bear that in mind. Or, of course, doing something you don't want to do, you know, like a, an alcoholic is probably doing something they don't want to do. He's drinking all the time, doesn't really yeah. want to. It is kind of useful. I, uh, what have you found, John? I've been teaching in the mornings, a small college, and um, I don't know how I feel about it when I do this. I easily fit into doing what I don't want to do. Right, great. So you can drop that usefully <laughs> as soon as the moment's right. And as soon as you're not letting anyone down, you can drop that. Yeah. Good. Anyone else got a useful insight to share? It's a handy tool. You, 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 know, you can make up any kind of 
four, as I said, it's a fourfold logic, a quadrant, um, or a, it's a Cartesian matrix, really. But whatever, you know, you can do anything you want. You can say, uh, oh, sounds so easy, I can't make one up. Somebody make one up for me. <laughs> um, I can't think why you would, but you know, you could do beautiful and ugly, and then you could do cheap and expen expensive and cheap, you know. Uh, so figure out what, what beauty you can afford. <laughs> well, it's a bit shallow, I admit, but... <laughs> yeah, that's interesting, because I hadn't, hadn't thought that it had been like watching, but when I do this, I couldn't put any place else. Isn't that interesting? interesting? how it helps to sort it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that, John. Has anyone got, you know, drawn a complete blank in one or more quadrants? Or I hope you've got something in there somewhere. Has anyone spotted, I mean, even if you don't want to share it with you, maybe just raise your hand. If, you, if you've seen, like John, you've seen something you hadn't quite seen before. No? Okay, fine. Not, not doing, not wanting to build. You spotted something in that no, thing. No. Oh, I see, I thought you said. No, I'm saying it's empty. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you need some help with it, or are you happy to just leave it empty? Okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was empty also, and then I realized that I don't want to do housework, and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. I just don't want to do it. Couldn't, couldn't you say that there maybe should be thousands of things in that quadrant? Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. So that's well, a million things. I don't want to do because I don't want to do it. Well, you're already probably not doing it. <laughs> that's right. So why would right. I think about it? That's, that's, where I was exactly, that's yeah. the clarification of my yeah. Right. In a, in a way, that seems obvious and, you know, kind of show, well, I'm not doing it, why would I? But sometimes it, it, there are interesting insights in that quadrant sometimes, you know, that the person realizes something was important to them, but they dropped it. And it does carry an emotional charge. Uh, and just seeing things and seeing truth often releases little elements of emotion. It's like just, what you said earlier about releasing the people who are ones and twos. I don't want to see certain people who are ones and twos, so I don't see them. Hmm. I don't even think about them. When I think about them, then I think about not wanting to think about them, so then I don't think about them again. Right. <laughs> Try not to think of an elephant, yeah. Mary, you had your hand up for a second. What was that? Well, I was just thinking about <clears throat> what I'm not doing, and I, actually, I don't want to do it, but I have to. <laughs> so I'm going to work with that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have to, you're doing it, right? So well, you, I'm but, not doing it, but I have to do it. I don't want to. You mean you should be doing it, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll work on that one. I'll get back to you. <laughs> All right, now we're going to go. <clears throat> we've done one, we've done two, we've done three, we've done four. Uh, Bennett had a fivefold that really didn't make a lot of sense to me, but we're going to jump now. We're going to We're going to go back to our one to ten, but in a different way. And I'm going to talk about probability. And this was invented by a guy who was an MD, Girolamo Cardano. Clever guy. He was a you know, doctor. He was a, um, uh, well, literally a Renaissance man. You know, he lived in Renaissance time. And as I say, a physician, uh, he was an inveterate gambler. And so he worked on a system of mathematics that would help his, uh, help his gambling and help him win. Didn't work because he died poor. <laughs> but it got him to develop the theory of probability. Oh, he was quite an inventive person. Uh, you guys, you men, will know what a cardan shaft is, yeah? You have the half shaft on a, on a drive, on a vehicle, yeah? Uh, he invented that for stagecoaches. For, for you girls, when, when a coach goes around the corner, the outside wheel's got to go faster than the inside wheel. Uh, so, in fact, you have to separate the two and the, the two half shafts. It's called a cardan shaft system. Uh, clever guy. He also invented quantum physics, because he invented probability, which quantum physics is really all probability. And it was just this scale of 1 to 10 thing, um, which is very simple. Uh, all probabilities based on numbers uh, and probabilities. But you, uh, you've got a scale where at one end is 0, which means it could never happen, no way in any shape or form could not possibly happen. If, if you could imagine such a thing. And at the state of one, that means it's absolutely certain, incontrovertibly, no chance of it ever not happening, must happen. Most things, of course, fall in between. And if you toss a coin, it's like 50-50, we call that 0 0.5. That's, that's how probability is calculated, okay? We don't want to do science and maths and probability. We're not going to get stuck here. Uh, but just to say that <clears throat> there is a scale here developing. You know, we've got far more values now than just, you know, yes or no, or maybe. Um, and you can actually quantify it. So and we, we often use it in our language, as you know, I've been using it today, but it's common everyday speech. 
you know, on a scale of one to ten, how do you feel today? That kind of thing. And then you get silliness. Well, actually, today is an eleven. Well, you know, it doesn't. Or if it's really bad, you say it's minus four hundred. I mean, you're feeling really crap. Uh, so we've now metamorphosed the language into stepping outside that scale. But we use that scale in that sort of way, don't we? Um, but I think this. Oops, I was going to say there's something, something better, which I'm going on to now. And this is the point of what you call what I'm calling infinity-valued logic, right? It doesn't have any defined values, it just has an infinite number of values, and it's really more about a direction. So at one end of your direction, you're heading towards good and happiness, and everything's groovy and living forever, and towards the other end of the scale is pain, and it's going wrong, and you're going to die. <laughs> and all values in between, and we, literally is infinite. You don't, we don't need to divide it up into pieces. That doesn't mean anything, as we see. Uh, <clears throat> so, so we're not too troubled about the ends, right? I mean, I know I've written happy end and sad end, or you know, right end and a wrong end. But it's not so much the end. You'd say this was a scale of happiness, you know, and this is more happy than that, and so on, rather than saying it's a happy, sad scale. Although we do have names for the ends. But, you know, we, we often lack, I mean, when you first construct a scale like this, you realize that language doesn't cover it. You know, we've got wrong, and then even more wrong, and very, very wrong, and then not quite so wrong. Eh, it's not 50-50, and then right, a bit more right, a lot more right. The wo actual technical words don't exist, do they? I mean, we know, we understand the concept, but language hasn't really covered it for us yet. Uh, there are some important characteristics to using a scale like that. First of all, there are no absolutes, so we bypass the whole idea of ends. You know, the scale doesn't end, it just goes on forever, that's infinity. So, however good something is, can always be better. And, you know, however much better, there's still better still. And however bad a, th however bad a thing is, it can be even worse. So, you know, it, it's got all kinds of inbuilt good things, so it can always be better, it can always be worse, no matter where you are on the scale. So, in fact, it's quite non-judgmental, you know, it's, in a way, it's, you might argue that a person's towards the wrong end, but we don't worry about things like that, it's really what direction you're trending is what really matters. Uh, and as I say, it is, you know, fundamentally it's not very judgmental. If you are travelling towards the happy end, it doesn't matter if you've been a complete gangster, villain, ruinous human being, if you've reformed and you're moving towards the good end, that's great, that's a nice thing. And similarly, it doesn't matter if you were you know, uh, the bishop, if you've you know, got your fingers in the offertory box taking the money, you're going the wrong way. <laughs> so it doesn't matter that you're a bishop and you're looking after a flock of millions. It's, so it's very redeeming. It means that nobody's wholly bad. And it also takes a few down the peg to, or two, because it means nobody's wholly good, of course. But we're not too worried about that. But at the bad end, nobody's wholly bad. You know, Hitler was supposed to be an awful man, you know, in world history is a, a reviled name. But if you go to Germany, Billy, you've been to Germany, haven't you? If you have Hitler ever comes up, oh, he's the guy that built the motorways. That's all, that's all they, they don't think he's the guy that killed lots of people. He's the guy that built the roads, that's what they think. Um, so there are, we've got rid of this kind of dichotomy idea. I know you, you can think in a dichotomy if you want, and you can say there's a good end and a bad end, but the way I use it, and the way I talk of it, and the way I would encourage you to use it, is to talk of a scale of goodness, just goodness, or a scale of or a scale of truth. You know, there's true and more true, and so on. You don't have to worry about lies and untruth at the other end. Uh, lo love is such a scale. I've got one in one of these talks. It's all about the scale of love. You know, wh where would you fill in the blanks? What's right at the right at this far end? You know, being, being a person and being one with them and so on, and right to the opposite end. And by the way, the opposite end of love is not, uh, it's not hate. Do you know that? You know that, yeah? Hate, uh, hate is a manifestation of love. You can't hate somebody if you didn't love them. The opposite end is just complete unknowing and indifference. The most unloving can be is you don't know who they are. I never heard of them. What are you talking about? <laughs> That's the opposite of love, really. Uh, how can we use this? Well, the Japanese are very good at it. You know, the Japanese economic miracle was all based on tiny little increments of improvement. They have a word for it even, which is interesting. They got the word, they got rich. They have a word, it's Kaizen. And it means, you know, just improving things and tweaking things and making them a little better all the time, never being satisfied. Is it, so is that a, how would you use Kaizen in a sentence? 
Uh, well, I, I don't speak Japanese, I'm afraid. <laughs> it, it, it's just a translation word. But let, let's pick our word, which is chunking, right? Um, you say by chunking things, you make them manageable so that you can make small improvements without being too big a challenge. Uh, and I suppose you could just substitute the word kaizen in saying that, but I don't know that Japanese use quite the same. Incremental improvement. Yes, incremental is the word. I used to, yeah, at one stage I called this the incremental scale of logic, but then I found myself having to explain what an increment was to so many people I gave up. <laughs> Language is awfully bad, you know, it's very frustrating as a writer. You've just got to get rid of all these lovely, delicious words, you know, there's some gore, you know, lugubrious. I mean, you must be never heard of it, no matter know what it means. It means sad, by the way. A tryst, you know, we, we know, we just use the word meeting, it's a very boring word, but tryst is a lovely poetic word and I mean English is particularly rich in these I and mean, it's the richest language in the world. Flagitious, that's another one. Flagitious <laughs> means very naughty or very wicked, very bad person. I have a, a writing piece which I call brush strokes and I use that as a metaphor for this kind of improvement. If you don't like your life, you know, don't sort of take a knife to the canvas and throw it away and try and paint it again. Just take some paint and paint out the bit you don't like, you know, and improve it. And then, you know, you don't like, this, don't like the left ear, repaint it so it looks good. And then repaint the, the other ear and, and, and keep repainting bits until eventually you get your new painting. But you don't have to do it all at once. <clears throat> now this is also a whole fresh look at ethics, right? Ethics and morals all seems to be really based, at least in religious arenas, is all pretty well based on it's right or it's wrong. You know, you're allowed to, you're not allowed to. That's the end of it. That's what they call ethics and morals, and it's, it's a crappy standard. This is a much fairer, much more intelligent standard, you know, in which to judge things. Something is ethical to the degree it moves it towards the right. It's unethical to the degree it moves it towards the left. You don't need words like right or wrong. You know, this is going in a good direction, that's going in a bad direction. So we don't want to go that way. Let's go this way. And, you know, thump, thumping the tub and making all these moral nice pronouncements doesn't serve anybody any good, really. So infinity valued logic is a very, very good approach to ethics. It's used in uh, John Travis's wellness spectrum. I don't know how many of you know that. There is a. Oh, right, okay. Well, you'll know uh, this spectrum, and I mean, I redrew this rather than just grabbing a graphic off the net, but there, you know, there's hundreds of graphics showing this, which is what we said. There's this uh, kind of infinite scale of values. You're getting more and more well, wellness, and going in this direction, less and less wellness or sickness. What's interesting in contrasting this model, here's the sort of neutral line, which is sort of, yeah, okay, you know, not ill, but not particularly good. All that medical treatments really focus on is bringing a person back to the neutral line. Problem, you know, why stop there? Medicine just does not visit this end of the scale. It isn't interested. If you believe in all that stuff, that's fine. <laughs> you know, that's all you get out of a doctor. They won't even admit it's there. <laughs> Never mind territory that they should be working in. <clears throat> so it's a very, a very good concept. And we, all the things that we've been said, like our own definitions of happiness, all valid, you know. All those values like you know, vitality and energy and involvement and integrity, courage, any of those nice words you can throw in, all have to do with wellness, don't they, if you think about it. And all have to do, uh, all have to do with the ultimate ethic as well. Okay, so we're going to just finish up with a quick practical exercise, and then another break, and then we're going to do the real meat and potatoes of the afternoon, the inner peace process. Okay. Uh, you don't have to do this now, because it will probably take you too long, but make a few notes so that you can continue it at home. And my experience in doing this with people for the first time is there's pages and pages and pages of answers to this question, right? A complete list of things that you haven't finished. Now, it's important because these things tie up your, your attention units. It's called the zygonic effect. I don't know if you've heard of that term. Um, it was probably simpler explained in terms of open and closed loops, right? If you've got things are still open and they're not being closed off, they're still open and not being closed off, eventually this starts tearing your mind and brain attention units everywhere so that, you, you know, you're less sharp, you're less on fire because it's, it's all drawn off in many, and the great psychological response to starting to close loops one by one is that you wake up 
uh, your energies come back. I mean, it's a way to get a fantastic resurge of energies to do this. So it is an important psychological step you could do. I'm just sorry, I've only like got four or five hours at the moment, so I'm going to try and shove everything in. Do it at home. But what you do, <clears throat> when you've got your list, and by the way, you can keep adding to the list, <clears throat> and things will keep coming to the surface. <clears throat> you know, you'll put something on the list and you think, oh my God, I didn't do that either, and oh, and that. You know, it will set off a, a trigger of memories, so just throw them on the list. But what I want you to do is prioritize them differently. The obvious thing is prioritize them important, you know, like Stephen Covey would. You know, that's important, that really isn't important. Don't do that, right? Do it on how easy or difficult it is to close the loop, right? So just put an E or an H. It's easy, or you can put an M for maybe or an intermediate if you want. But the important thing is to pinpoint the easy ones, pinpoint the hard ones, do not do what all the gurus tell you to do. Pick the number one important thing that's holding you back and do that. Because you won't. You haven't done it for months or years. You're not going to do it now, right? <laughs> what you do is pick the real cinchy ones. You pick the low-hanging fruit, right? So you'd start with the easiest. And you do it. Maybe it only take 10 minutes. Maybe you have to walk upstairs, take something out of a drawer. Just do it, for goodness sake. And then you do another one, and another one, and pretty soon you find you can do six, eight, or ten of these things in maybe an hour or two. They, go, they just fire off very quickly. The change that takes place in how you feel is that then you've got a better approach to the ones that are more difficult. And again, don't go charging off for the hardest. Leave that to the last. So they cleared all the rest, you're like a monster of, you know, uh, what's he called, a jolly green giant, you've done it all, you know, you can, you can deal with anything now. Uh, that's the way to approach this, and it's completely the, the opposite of what I've ever heard gurus teaching, and it's silly. But the zygonic effect is so important, I can't tell you. Until you've done this, and gone, wow, and seen your space clean out, it's like a huge detox in its own way. Because each of these little hung-up open loops carries a little bit of emotional attention, a little bit of intellectual attention, it draws a little bit of energy, it's keeping you from the present and the now and your, your main activity and engagement. I really commend this to you highly. I'm sorry that there isn't time enough to demonstrate this to you because for one thing, you need to be at home, don't you? Obviously, you know, the first thing on the list isn't going to be here in this room. It's going to be at home. Unless it's something like I haven't kissed my wife for a month. <laughs> Uh, oh, that's, so, sorry, that's what I've just been saying. So you just pick the ten easiest ones, you do those first, then you pick another bunch of the easiest ones. Work from easy to hard, and pretty soon you're going to feel like a winner, you're going to be closing loops. Okay, so it might have seemed quite a dry subject to start with, you know, power logic or infinite valued logic, but as you see it's got some amazing applications in life. There are more, but this is all I've got time to share for with you folks. Okay, thanks very much for that. We're going to take another short 10-15 minute break. Then we're going to do what's really the meat and potatoes. The thing I most want to share with you all is how to do this inner peace process. It's amazing and you'll just have a lot of fun with it. Okay, 15 minutes please. <laughs>